practice last night, but I had a feeling that it might be like this in the morning. And I, I didn't want to be the one that didn't show up. That would have been very awkward. Um, but thanks for coming up and joining me and coming and talk about security, right? One of my favorite pastimes, but unfortunately, I don't think it's everybody's favorite pastime, right? Um, so I do appreciate that. So, so folks that don't know, my name is Tony Perez. You can find me online on Perez Box. I'm known for a lot of information that I put out around security, but specifically for end user security um, on content management systems like Joomla, WordPress, Drupal, Magento, those kind of things. That's kind of what we specialize. But more importantly is I work for an organization called Security. Security has um, been in business for about five years, and they focus predominantly only on website security. So we're looking at attacks, infections, things like that. To put it into scale to help you understand what it is we do and how we come up with the information we present, um, right now we manage a little bit over 40 billion unique page views through our network. Um, we're doing about 30 million attack mitigations a month through our network. We're also scanning a little bit over 3 million domains in our network, looking for indicators of compromise, infections, things like that. And we're cleaning a little bit over 500 websites a day, just to kind of help you understand scale and the basis of the information that we provide. Importantly is we do all websites, uh, all technologies specifically. So whether it's WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, we don't, uh, we don't discriminate, right? <laughs> we're an equal opportunity website security company. Um, but in short, we clean and protect websites. With that being said, the one thing that we have come to terms with over the past five years is that there is one constant in security, and that is change. It's a continuously evolving space, um, which is why it's so important that we get up here and we continue to kind of talk about the various things that we're seeing, the trends, the threats, things like that. Um, and I like to focus specifically on the website owners and the end users, but it's very important as developers and um, integrators to be thinking through that because um, what we've learned is that the website owners will do very little to protect themselves. And so it comes down to us as um, the developers and integrators to help them through that process. The most concerning aspect of, um, of, of things for us are the things that website owners can't control. There's a lot of things that they can and things that we can assist them in controlling, but um, the evolution of the vulnerabilities and the security issues that we're seeing specifically in 2014 and 2015 is getting to a point where the fabric of the technology that we leverage for our platform is being attacked and we kind of a little bit lost in terms of how do we go about addressing that? And that's amplified through the media as well. We have to do a better job of educating and bringing awareness um, to the end users, to the consumers, to the website owners, and not just them, but to ourselves as developers and integrators. Um, I, I like to think that a lot of developers and integrators have a good understanding of security, and I've learned over time that that's not necessarily the case. Right? Uh, we're mostly builders, we're mostly uh, building solutions to point it for our end users, but we often ourselves fail to think about security, and that's a big problem. So I want to break things down into three main categories, right? I'm going to talk about vulnerabilities, I'm going to talk about attacks, and I'm going to talk about infections. Those are kind of the three worlds that I live in um, and the three things that I kind of, I think that will be very useful for us to pay attention to. Specifically on software vulnerability side. When I talk about software vulnerabilities, as of late, I've started to break things out into vulnerabilities that are within the application and vulnerabilities that are beyond the application. What do I mean by beyond the application? These are the things that we, as a community have a hard time being able to address because we just depend on them being able to work. Somebody else is supposed to address this. A classic example of this was Heartbleed. Right? Who's familiar with Heartbleed in here? Right? Heartbleed was a very, uh, very serious vulnerability in attacking the OpenSSL libraries in which we all depend for our encryption. The challenge with Heartbleed was that not only did it attack the encryption mechanism between websites through SSL, but it also attacked the encryption mechanisms that we use, like for instance, IAM, VPN, things like that, right? So the information that we were assuming to be protected was no longer protected. Now, as the developers or the builders and the integrators of technologies like Joomla, how do we address that for the consumer? The consumer only sees that the internet is, is, is dying, is melting, right? All of a sudden, everything's in danger, and it's on us to educate them, like, no, let's calm down. These are the implications of that. That led us into Shellshock. Um, so Hartley was in April 2014. That led us into Shellshock in September 2014. And this, unlike... Um, Heartbleed was an attack specifically on the operating system, on all Nix-based operating systems. Are you familiar with Shellshock? So um, Shellshock was uh, a means where it attacked the born-again shell, 
within all Nix distributions. That means anything that was Linux, anything that was Unix. So even the Macs that you're responsible for right now, or the, folks, the, the platforms that you're leveraging. The challenge with that becomes that um, in order for it to work, you have to pass environmental variables to the Linux um, born-again shell. Now, you would think, okay, well, I should be good to go with my web servers. Well, what do we all depend in our applications? Right? We depend on Linux. In most of the open source applications like WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, they're all built on LAMP or some variation of that, and it all uses Linux to some extent. In that situation, we said, well, our web servers should be safe. Our web servers should be safe because nobody can really access that. That's production, um, and there's really no means of connecting to that. Enter cPanel. cPanel came in, and through, we, we found at Security the ability to pass environmental variables through the way cPanel was configured. That automatically made 2.9% of the websites online susceptible to a bash compromise. In other words, bash allowed for remote code execution. That meant that the attackers using a website via cPanel would be able to attack the server and abuse it. That's a very, very scary proposition. Again, cPanel being a third-party application technology that we don't have control over, right? We look at the things that we built. So this is kind of continuously talking about the evolution of, of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing. Fast forward to October 2014. Just so you know, 2014 in the security space was recognized as the year of the vulnerability. In 2013, the, um, the year was looked in the security space as the year, the year of the data breach. We saw millions and millions of, of, of websites get intact information being siphoned out and shared. Um, enter Poodle. So Poodle, again, was an attack on encryption. Unlike Heartbleed, where the attacker had to do a memory dump of the server to see what was being communicated, Poodle functioned as a man-in-the-middle attack. So a man-in-the-middle attack means I can intercept the communication between point A and point B, and that's what Poodle did. But what specifically what they did was they targeted SSL version 3 was a dep deprecated encryption mechanism, or it wasn't deprecated, but it was an older version of, of a transport layer security, right? So TLS, what we're, we're accustomed to today through SSL. Now, what the attackers would do is they would intercept the communication, they would shoot back a response saying, no, I need SSL version 3, and because of backwards compatibility, the browser, the servers, would all res or the websites would respond appropriately, downgrading the encryption mechanism to a more susceptible encryption. Okay, that's a very rudimentary description of how that worked. Now, um, this is a big concern to the community. Now, unlike, so the next one I'm gonna talk about, this was a little bit easier to handle, right? The community responded very fast. The browsers, you know, started um, disabling SSL version three. You know, firewalls were disabling the, the ability to do downgrade attacks. Um, it was really, really straightforward to attack. Now we are in 2015 and we see Logjam. Now, Logjam's a lot of noise right now. It, it, it's a little bit impractical to think how it would be attacked. But in this instance, again, another attack on encryption. The fabric of what we depend on for secure communication continues to be attacked. And this, again, is a technology that we just depend to work. Now, in Logjam, what they're doing is doing a downgrade attack again on TLS, but focusing specifically on um, a 512-bit, five five right? So they're trying to downgrade the, the, the communication and um, and, and use a more susceptible version. Now, the challenge with this is that it's a little bit unrealistic. It doesn't, it doesn't happen at that scale. And a lot of organizations, unlike Poodle, what they were not able to do is block it by default because a lot of the more modern browsers were still using TLS and still using the ability to downgrade. So that becomes a very big challenge. And so when some of them were trying to disable that, we started seeing communication failures. Websites weren't working. People were complaining. And so it, things like this become very difficult to address. And, it's our belief that this, these kind of attacks, they follow the mindset in the, in the hacking community of own one, own them all. If I can break encryption, that means no information on the web is safe. We depend, we depend on it for everything. We depend on how we do, especially in commerce, high transactions. And what's the big thing that Google pushed last year? SSL, right? All of a sudden, SSL is a huge, it's not a huge, it's going to be a ranking factor, which usually means that it'll be used for your SEO because they're trying to make the, the web a secure place. But in reality, all it's doing is making things a little bit more challenging. As I mentioned a minute ago, all this goes against attacks against the technology that we depend on. I would argue that a majority of us as developers and integrators rarely think about OpenSSL, rarely think about the vulnerabilities on the server. In fact, many of us say, that's the host's responsibility, right? I just build stuff. I just deploy it. I give it to my website owner. They'll take care of it. Right? That's not necessarily the case. As the developers and integrators, we are the trusted sources for our website owners. They come to us, they ask us questions, and they say, why didn't you protect me against this? But it's a fundamental lack of understanding of how it works is the challenge. The media, of course, doesn't help. 
the media jumps on every opportunity to exasperate the situation and say, oh my gosh, the internet is failing. Oh my gosh, everything's hackable. Everything's have a security issue. That's a big challenge for us. It, it, it complicates our ability to communicate and educate audiences because everybody's an expert, right? Everybody can Google and everybody say, well, this is what Google says. And of course, everything on Google is correct. Um, and we have to kind of fight that. That makes it very challenging. And everybody questions it. Well, that's not how it works. I was like, well, actually it is. But no, but that's what Google said, or that's what CNN said, or that's what you know, Fox said, or whatever. And then that inundates us as developers trying to figure out how to, how to address that. So that's kind of talking about beyond the application. Very limited things that we can do for that, right? Other people focus on this. It's on us just to understand it and communicate it. Now let's kind of focus and uh, tune ourselves back into like within the application. What's going on in that space? And the, the greatest challenge um, within CMSs, which is what I like to tell folks, is especially in the open source communities like the Joomla and the WordPress and the Drupal, these applications were built around extensibility. That's why people use them, right? We built the core. We deploy the core. People build modules, plugins, themes. They have the ability to you know, quickly extend the application to do a, a myriad of things, from e-commerce to a basic blog to a, a complex co content management system. And all that is facilitated through a numbers of extensions. And that's great. But what I also tell folks is like, while the extensibility was an important piece of the application, it's also one of the biggest things that leads to the, its insecurity in all platforms, regardless of what it is. And let's remember, it's easy for us to look and say, oh, this platform is getting bombarded with security. It doesn't address us. But in fact, we need to change that mindset. And we need to say, let's be grateful it's not us. Because I can assure you that every platform has issues. It's just that nobody's focusing on Joomla or may not be focusing on Drupal or may not be focusing on Magento, that every one of them has it. And what we need to be doing is looking at it and say, would that have happened to us? What are we doing as a community to ensure that we have best practices in place to address when vulnerabilities are released? Because it's going to affect the brands. One of the major ones, one of the major vulnerabilities that everybody loves to talk about is cross-site scripting. Right? Oh, cross-site scripting here, cross-site scripting here. If you look at the list in Val in terms of all the uh, recent vulnerabilities, it's cross-site scripting, right? Everybody goes crazy for cross-site scripting. The media loves it. You know, the, the internet's failing. But in reality, in the security space, it's the one vulnerability like we love to hate, you know? Because in most instances, it's insignificant. It's inconsequential. It really does much. There, there, there are varying degrees of cross-site scripting. Persistent cross-site scripting is a concern, right? If I can get it to the server and it always renders on sites, great. But the one attribute that cross-site scripting doesn't have that we look for in the security space is automation. Today's attacks are, are greatly automated to, to a large extent. Over 95% of the attacks we're seeing are automated. Cross-site scripting is fundamentally different. Cross-site scripting requires some form of social engineering, some form of engagement with the user, and it's often attributed with a targeted attack. OK, I can see it. I can do some manipulation. I can send it to the user, and we're good to go. And I can get them to click on it. I need the user to act, to do something, right? That in itself reduces the sever severability of that vulnerability. So it always frustrates me when we see it because it, it, it takes away from the more serious issues that we've got going on. A classic example of this, remote code execution. Remote execution is the ability for the user to pass variables to your server and take full control. This is a very, very serious thing. Fortunately for us, in a lot of communities, um, it's not very common. It's not something that we see day in and day out. We definitely don't see it in core as often as we might have seen in the early days in all platforms. We've done a really good job about that. We rarely see it in plugins, extensions, themes like that. So that's a very, very good thing. But when they come out, it's a very serious thing. It's, it's rarely not top of the list and something that needs to be addressed immediately. Enter arbitrary file uploads. Arbitrary file uploads is the process of being able to take a file from a, a distinct location, an external device, and enter it into your device. This is a little bit more concerning, right? This you can usually you know, um, add it to other vulnerabilities to have a bigger impact. But this is my ability to take a backdoor, a file. Uh, you're not sanitizing the information correctly, and I can upload my backdoor. Now I, I can bypass all your access controls. We see this a little bit more than remote code execution. And that's a little bit of a concern because it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. Remote file inclusion attacks. This takes advantage of a lot of programming languages and their ability to include parameters or, or properties from, uh, or libraries from other locations. Now, traditionally, you would not allow that to happen remotely. You would not allow me to include a file from my server that allowed me to pass some, you know, properties to your variables through your environment, right? That just should not happen. Unfortunately, some of us, when we code, we don't account for somebody abusing our includes. And what happens then is uh, some users can uh, take that, abuse it, and, and inject something remotely. When that happens, that's recognized as an RFI. That we see a little bit more. 
injections. Injections is probably next to cross-site scripting in terms of the volume of stuff that we see. Injections can be object injections. They can be SQL injections. SQL injections is probably what everybody gets plagued with the most, right? The ability to pass uh, properties or variables to your database or, um, you know, we see that with data breaches. We see that they can pass um, uh, command execution uh, code to your database as well. Take, a, you know, control of your database or take control of your, data, um, your, your server as well. So it's a big concern and we see it a lot. Um, local file inclusions, similar to remote file inclusions, but it's local. Right? So I'm not injecting a file remotely from the environment, but if I couple an LFI with an AFU, I can now upload my file and include that via your inclusion. Access control bypass. Now, I'm going to talk about access control a little bit as we continue to move through this um, discussion. But in this instance, this is really kind of the attack against business logic. It's my ability, essentially, to do role escalation of some kind. I can take your code. I can then say, I'm going to go from a basic author or, uh, or a contributor, and now I'm going to be an administrator, and I can do administrative things on your site, whether um, it's manipulating po or, or uh, articles or whatever the case may be, or um, taking advantage of, of some of the administrative type functions. When we look at this, and when we look at the, the, the wide range of these, the seven different vulnerabilities I identified, this is how we see the world on the security space from a priority standpoint, right? Remote execution all the way at the top, cross-site scripting all at the bottom. It doesn't mean that it's not important. That's not the point. But if everything was important, then nothing would be important. So for us, when we're going through code and we're trying to find vulnerabilities, this is how we categorize it. But we couple it with one more thing. We look at authentication versus unauthentication. If something is, a vulnerability is um, susceptible via an unauthenticated manner, so for instance, say I could do a, um, an RFI or an RFI attack as an administrator, right? Well, if the attacker is the administrator, you have other problems, right? They could probably do whatever they want because they are an administrator. So the severity won't be as high for us. Now, if a contributor or an author can do one of those vulnerabilities or attack one of those vulnerabilities, then the severity goes up greatly because that user, that role, is not allowed to do that. Okay, um, and, and, and so that's how we look at the world. And then there's things like C serves as well, where I take advantage of your authentication and, and try to log in as you, you know, take advantage of your session. The other challenge we're seeing with vulnerability specifically is the pace at which they're being attacked. Heartbleed, for instance, was an example of within hours, we saw massive attacks against it. That talks to the speed at which the attackers are working. A classic example was in last year when we looked at Drupal. Drupal had a very serious SQL injection attack or vulnerability um, in core. They came out and they said, if you did not patch within eight hours, consider your environment compromised. That is a very, very big statement for Drupal to come out and say, their security team. But that talks to the seriousness of what we're dealing with. And so then the question I ask all the communities that I engage with is, what are we doing to address that? The vulnerabilities are just getting faster. The severities are just becoming bigger. And the attackers are thinking and evolving their way of thinking. It's no longer of, oh, I'm just going to look at this code and see if you didn't sanitize anything. What we're seeing is complex attacks combining multiple bugs to introduce one major vulnerability. That's a big concern for us because a lot of developers don't think like breakers. Developers are builders by nature. Breakers is a fundamentally different way of thinking, and they look to destroy everything you build. We, you have to be built that way. We also have to remember that vulnerabilities are found in every piece of code. This is something that we recognize on the technical side of the community. It is something that end users just do not comprehend. They expect that everything you deliver is free of any bugs and free of any vulnerabilities. And this introduces a big challenge. It's a big education game for us, a big awareness. And the problem is, as adoption continues to grow for platforms, it gets even harder because it's just difficult to scale that awareness factor. That being said, it's my belief that it's also why we're seeing huge growth in managed environments, the square spaces, the Wix the Weeblies of the world, right? They're growing in popularity because they're giving something to the end users, to the website owners, that a lot of open source platforms, a lot of CMSs like Joomla just can't deliver. They cannot give them the reassurances that they're looking for. That's just the fact of it. Every day, they're growing in popularity and becoming a challenge for every platform on the market right now. So with that, we talked about vulnerabilities. We got a little bit depressed about that. Now we're going to get into attacks. And I can't guarantee you won't get depressed about the attacks either. 
okay? Um, but let's just chat with them. The big thing we're seeing a lot right now is brute force. Now, brute force in the traditional sense of security is it's 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 it can be very complex, right? You, you can have rainbow tables. You're, you're, you're kind of combining a bunch of variations. The whole intent of brute force, though, is to gain access to something that you don't normally have access to. Okay? What we're seeing is this being evolved for the web. Now, there's still, there's still challenges. There's still network latency issues. We don't see them in, in large scales. Unlike uh, rainbow table attacks or dictionary attacks that you could do in a, in a local environment, I could do within seconds, things take a little bit longer. You know, hosts are, are throttling the attacks. If you see multiple requests, I can stop that, things like that. I have, you know, things like ModSec or other firewalls that can help throttle it, but we're still seeing it. What we are seeing, though, is the information that was disclosed in 2013 as the huge data breaches, the millions and millions of sites that were released, we're seeing that make its way into these brute force attacks. So we're seeing very specific attacks against access control points. So against administrator uh, login panel, right? Username, password, username, password. And we're seeing the variations don't make sense. They're not traditional dictionaries. Like, wait, wait a minute, where did they even get this email? Where did they even get this password? It's not, it, it's not a dictionary password, it's a randomly generated password. How, how did that even happen? And so it, it, there's just like this, this Ev evolution of information that was compromised here, just kind of migrating its way through the underbelly and getting into different tool sets, okay? And unfortunately, it's leading to compromises. Why? Because as website owners and even as individuals or humans, we're not as unique as we think we are, right? And so we like to think like, ah, yeah, they will never know my email, right? They will never know my password. And I would just get, even if it's randomly generated, I'm going to use this same password across my 15 login environments. You know, my Facebooks and my social medias and my, because you know, it's so unique. But the thing is that once you use that unique password one time and you use it multiple times, it's, it's security decreases, right? Especially when there's major compromise because now that password is known. Now it's part of a list. And that's what's happening. And folks just don't realize for whatever reason that, that that's what occurs. Then we move into denial of service. Denial of service is actually becoming a big business. Right? Um, it's, it's, they've actually created a business out of it, like a denial of service as a service type model. You have a lot of these booter services. You can go in and say, I don't like this guy, so I'm going to just pay five bucks this month and I'm going to dis you know, disrupt them. Unlike brute force, brute force can lead to denial of service. So based on your configuration, I can kill your availability. And that's what denial of service focuses on. Denial of service is focused on, can I disrupt the availability of your site? One of the main tenets of security, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If I can disrupt your availability, I win. Especially if you're a large site. Especially if you're a competitor. Especially if I just don't like you. Right? Five bucks, I take you down for 24 hours? Psh, I'm game. And I'm not held accountable? Sweet. Right? And that's what's happening. Then, of course, there's vulnerability exploitation. Right? We just talked about all these vulnerabilities. Vulnerability exploitation is on the rise. Right? This is URI-based attacks looking to exploit any of the vulnerabilities that I just identified. They're taking the domain, they're malforming the URI request, they're malforming the post requests, and they're trying to attack the server because it's an easy point of entry, especially in large organizations. Large organizations that may deploy network firewalls, looking at the network, they all most often do SMTP tunneling, as HTTP tunneling, so they have to let the layer 7 traffic through. So it's a beautiful attack vector for us as security people. Psh, let's go in through the HTTP tunnel. We know that it's been allowed, and we'll just malform the requests and try to exploit those vulnerabilities. The other thing is abuse of trust. This continues to happen, right? What we see on the website owners is things like node extensions, node themes. In other words, um, premium, premium solutions that we buy we modify, we put a backdoor in, and we deploy it. And people go on Google and say, give me the, the, the best free backup um, solution. And Akiba comes up, and they're like, it's free? That's awesome. And everybody feels like they won. What they did is they got the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, they have a backdoor. They have some other injection that will continue to serve up spam or has some redirect of some kind. And they, they're like, what's going on? I don't understand. But that's a, that's a form of abusing trust. Right? They, they, they trust Google, they, they depend on it, but it doesn't just come in that form. It comes in all the services we use. A form of abuse of trust is exactly what we talked about a minute ago. SSL. When was the last time anybody looked at that and said, whoa, SSL might have an issue? We just kind of depended on it. We trusted it. Another example are things like CDNs. Just recently, Washington Post got hacked. They got hacked not via their application, not via their infrastructure, but they got hacked via their CDN. Okay? 
things for us as well. People attack our DNSs all the time. They attack our social sites, things like that. Another form of user trust is phishing lures. Phishing lures is becoming a really, really big problem, right? Phishing lures is essentially a form of, of social engineering. So um, I see one of you. I, I identify you use a specific bank. I spoof the, the bank's email. I send you an email and I say, oh, by the way, you've just logged out of your session. Please log back in. Or it, you know, we're doing a routine password security check. You have to update your username and password. Some of us may laugh about that and say, I'd never fall for that. But your mom might. Your brothers and sisters might. Another website owner might. It happens all the time. It happens so much that Google itself flags your site for phishing alone. There's companies dedicating their services just to focusing on phishing. It's such a problematic issue. And the challenge with phishing, it's difficult to detect on the security side scanning websites because phishing doesn't display on the browser, right? The whole goal of phishing is it doesn't get detected. So what we'll see is we'll see them layered in. We'll see them in the libraries. We'll see them in the includes deep, deep within the directory structure because it doesn't matter where they live. As an attacker, when I send you that spoofed email, I'm just going to hyperlink it in my text, and you'll never see it. Most people don't go through the process of hovering over a link and seeing, oh, that's the right URL. They just don't do that. So with that being said, let's move into infections. Okay? Um, infections, the way I see infections, is the results of everything we just discussed. Right? So infections would be, um, if I was successful in my attack, what would I have done? What do I want to do? And when I do that, I, sp I talk specifically to results and impacts of infections, right? So in other words, what was the result of the compromise? And then what is the impact of that infection to me as a website owner? So let's start with the results. We have to recognize that not all compromises display the results. There are multiple reasons for attacking somebody. And sometimes it's not to distribute malware. Sometimes it's just simply to take advantage of the resources that you have, the brand that you have. Sometimes it's simply to add it to my larger botnet. And so when you understand that, if you're remediating an environment, you have to account for that. And in, the way I like to tell folks is infections are like an iceberg. What you see is usually but 10% of the real problem. If you're showing a symptom, be grateful that you see that symptom. That means that you actually know you have a problem. What you need to be concerned about are things that are not displaying and that are infected. That's the problem. A classic example is drive-by downloads. Drive-by downloads is very, very prevalent right now. And it's actually very prevalent on the mobile side. Everybody's talking about mobile. And even we are in security. It's a huge, huge target. The web is still the number one distribution mechanism. About 80% of the malware is being distributed via the web. There's no denying that. But social media, mobile are all at introducing different dynamics for us, right? Everybody wants to control the mobile environments because that's where everybody's going. If you look at the traffic trends, the traffic trends all lead to more searches, more engagement is happening on a mobile. So it only makes sense that I target that, especially droid devices. I hate to say it, right? But droid devices are a huge target. And drive-by downloads are exactly that. It's the ability to take a payload and install it on the endpoint, whether the endpoint's a notebook, a desktop, or a mobile device. Interestingly enough, we're seeing a big rise in what's known as ransomware. Now, ransomware was always something that was reserved for desktops, right? Um, it was the act of me being able to control the entire environment and say, um, I've now encrypted your machine. If you want your information, you need to pay me $1,000. Okay? That's how it worked. How do you do that on the web? Right? How do you, now, what they, what they take advantage of is our lack of, of knowledge on, this, on the consumer side. What they do is they'll use a drive-by redirect, or uh, they'll do a malicious redirect on the site to the user to another location, and it'll say FBI or some other law enforcement and say, you are doing something malicious, and people will pay. One guess where this is happening the most right now, and people are paying. Exactly. Pornographic sites. There's nothing worse than guilt to get somebody to pay. And the kicker here is that nothing's, nothing's being encrypted, right? All they're doing is redirecting to a ransom page that says, you're doing something malicious, you've been tracked, and you must pay. That in itself should be a red flag. But it's not. 
and people will pay it because they feel that they've been caught doing something wrong. And the kicker is all they have to do is close their browser. Right? This just goes to show you. And it's on the rise. That means that it's being highly, highly effective. Yet another reason why we have to figure out and, and ensure that we communicate to our users that not only do they have to be aware of that as a, 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 a normal end user of the web, but they need to be looking at what their website is doing. Are they part of that process? Malvertising. Malvertising is an interesting thing. Malvertising is another one of those things that abuses our trust. Malvertising is also on the rise. I don't know if that's because the environments are becoming harder to compromise. I don't know if because the hosts are doing a better job or the code's better. I, I don't know what's going on there, but malvertising just continues to increase. My only thought on that is that it's this idea on the, on the hacking world of own one, own them all. If I know that everybody wants to make money online, I know that a lot of people want to use ad networks. So if I tar focus all my energy in compromising ads, ad networks, it's to my advantage. And the beautiful thing about ad networks is that the whole point of ad networks is to allow you to customize when ads show. So if they can compromise the environment, inject the payload within the header of the images, they're golden, right? It'll show for the right audiences. And that's a challenge for website owners. So the website owners will see that they have an issue, but they won't be able to replicate. They'll go through their environment, they're trying to figure out, and they won't be able to replicate. It won't be until you start going through all their stuff. I'm like, wait, these are all these ads, and you have to wait for all the ads to cycle. And not just that, it's highly conditional. So you have to f meet the right conditions. Am I on a Windows box using IE6? Am I using XP versus v Vista 7? Am I on a Mac versus you know, a Linux box? Whatever the case may be. SEO spam. SEO spam is fundamentally different in that it's not a nefarious act. It's not trying to manipulate the endpoint. SEO spam is specific to the affiliate business. It, 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 it targets black hat SEO um, spammers in which what they're trying to do is generate income. It's e e basic econ economics. If they can take advantage of your audience, if they can take advantage of your search engine result pages, they can get impressions for every single click. And industries like the casino industry, industries like the pharmaceutical industry, they only care about the volume. They don't care about any other action beyond the impression. So those black hats have the opportunity to make money on every single impression that occurs on SEO spam. And the kicker here is that you probably won't see it. The kicker here is that when you look at your site, there are instances in which it will be injected within the, within the lines of, of content and text. But there's a lot of instances where it will be off screen, you know, negative 900 pixels by negative 900 pixels. The user doesn't see it in their browser, but guess who doesn't care? The Googles, the Bings, the Baidus of the world, right? They, they just don't care. They'll just they'll pick it up in a heartbeat, and they'll rank for it. Backdoors. I talked about AFUs. This is a, a, a big mechanism um, uh, vector for backdoors, right? If I can take advantage of an AFU vulnerability, I can inject a backdoor into the environment. The beautiful thing about backdoors is that it gives me full control. So when we think about backdoors and the purpose of backdoors, that's that 90% that I was talking about, that, that thing that you always have to be looking for. The backdoors allow us to bypass any existing controls, any existing systems you have in place. Now, the purpose of backdoors, when we think about it, we have to think of the anatomy of attacks. As a hacker, when we go to try to penetrate an environment, we have four distinct functions we do, right? We're doing recognition, we're doing identification, we're doing exploitation, and then we're doing sustain sustainment. So we're, we're I'm trying to identify and recognize which environments are we interested in. I'm interested in Joomla 1.5x. I know there's a lot of vulnerabilities in there. I know that there's no upgrade path for those users. There's a shitload of those users out there, so I'm going to attack that. I identify what exactly, what vulnerability I'm specifically looking for, and then I begin my exploitation process. Once I've gained entry into the environment, I then look to how do I sustain this. I know that at some point, my attack will be identified. I know at some point, my payload will be identified. So how do I ensure I retain access to that entire environment? And I do that through things like backdoors. Backdoors in all forms. Backdoors in images. Backdoors in PHP files. Backdoors in, in a wide range of stuff. Resource abuse. Resource abuse is very, very prevalent. I said, not everybody that attacks you wants to display something. This is very, this is very true, especially in environments where you, for instance, send out email. Email spam is huge right now. And they're doing that via your same resources. They engage in your, your environment. They take advantage of your resource. They send out thousands and thousands. Next thing you know, your IP has been blacklisted by all the MX blacklisters. And you're like, why isn't anybody receiving my emails? Okay. Waterhole attacks. Now, 
water hole kind of can fit in the toxin, it can fit in infections. Okay? I introduced this because I like to talk to folks about the greater responsibility we have to the internet as a whole. And what I mean by that is water holes, similar to what you would think in Africa and other locations, is where the animals come and congregate. We do the same thing in, say, water coolers in our offices. We go and we congregate in a specific location. What attackers are doing is they're using, they're finding different ways into environments without attacking the environment directly. Because the people that work at the, in these enterprise environments are just like every one of us. They're everyday people. They go on the internet. They navigate sites. They look for certain things. So if I wanted to attack GM, why would I go against the infrastructure of GM? Why wouldn't I target specifically those people in Detroit, look at specific sites that I think those people look at, and wait for them to just come to me. And if they, sp if they fit specific requirements, they're using Windows 7, they might be running IE8. I'm okay with that. Now I've isolated my attack to a much smaller segment versus the internet as a whole. And I just wait. And when the right people come that meet my criteria, they get infected. The odds of detection decrease, my odds of success increase. The impacts. Impacts of after these infections. And this is a big thing. We look at things of economics, right? There's a cost associated with it. Whether you hire somebody to clean it, whether it's your own time, believe it or not, your time is worth something. Um, whether it's the time invested in, in talking to SEO professionals to get your, rebuild your brand. Speaking of that, is your brand. How do people feel about your brand when they go to your site now? Say somebody went and had a drive-by download and they lost all their finances because they downloaded a financial Trojan. They may not like you as a brand. If you get blacklisted, that might be a problem. We've seen in blacklisting where in individuals or websites will lose over 95% of their traffic in a 12-hour period the minute they're blacklisted. Now, imagine it's your client. Imagine it's one of you, and you depend on your website for leads, or you depend on it for commerce. What would that kind of loss do for you? How would that make you feel? And that takes us to the emotional state. A lot of us don't realize it, but I used to spend a lot of time on phone calls talking to clients. And there's a huge emotional piece that goes into getting your site online. We, don't, we may not recognize it, but it's, a, it's an extension of us as individuals. It's an extension of our businesses. It's in some instances, it may be the first time we get a site up online, or it might be how we engage with our communities. And when we lose it and we feel out of control, that's exactly what it is. It's a feeling that you can't, like, you can't control it. You don't understand what's going on. Why would anybody do this to my site? There's a huge emotional toll that comes with that. And then before you know it, you're extremely paranoid about everything you do online. It's almost like identity theft. Identity theft th happens, next thing you know, you never want to give somebody your credit card. Then there's the hosting. A lot of folks don't realize that in hosting, there's a disclaimer in the terms of service that says, if you, if you do anything to our environment that potentially impacts us, we can disable you. Now, that doesn't happen with every host, and they don't all exercise that, but a lot of them do. And that catches a lot of folks by surprise. Because a lot of folks expect that their hosts will give them the security. Both developers and website owners alike. Well, the host will take care of that. And that's not necessarily the case. I, I look around the room and this is kind of what I see. right? It's kind of like this dire state. Like, wow, this guy's really depressing. Um, and I apologize for that. It's just the, the nature of security. And we like to be as forthcoming as we possibly can with everything that's happening so that we can make better decisions because we feel that it's through education and awareness that we combat the threats that we're seeing. That being said, one of the biggest things that we need to be doing is stop trusting the users. I can assure you that the users don't care about their security. The only time they care about their security is after the compromise has occurred. That's just the reality of it. So we need to be thinking, how do we address that? And often we do that by looking at things like better defaults. We have a bad tendency as open source communities to say, well, give them the options. They'll figure it out. But the reality is that that is not effective. And that's happening in all platforms, not just Joomla, in WordPress, in Drupal, the same exact thing. We're even seeing this in things like iCloud and Google after the latest compromises. They're saying, no, we will force you to have two-factor authentication. We will force you to introduce multi-factor. It'll just become the default for how you do business. We need to be looking at that. We need to be looking and saying, what can we do as a community to help improve the website owner's posture? Because the website owner cares about one thing. They care about getting online and getting their content out and never being affected. They don't care how that happens. Access control. We need to spend more time on access control. Can we do better defaults around password generation? It should, in this day, passwords should not be the problem. 
We shouldn't have to continue to deal with that, but we do. So how can we do that? We know that users and users believe themselves to be unique. We also know that they're not unique. So let's address that. Let's randomly generate those passwords by default and say, no, this is what you will use. Force them to say, no, that's too complex. I want to use I love Lucy, and I change it. And then you can go back and say, are you sure? Like, do you really want to do this? Adding those additional steps are cumbersome, but are very, very important. Communication. I cannot stress the importance of communication. It all comes down to awareness and education. And so we have to continue to do this. We have to continue to engage. We have to be, continue to be forthcoming with the challenges. And we don't have to sugarcoat them. We don't have to over-exaggerate them. But we have to be talking about it. We can't do and say, well, it doesn't exist. Put our heads in the sand and say, this doesn't apply to us. Because then it does. That being said, patch management. This is something that our predecessors, the desktop world, learned the hard way the Microsofts of the world, right? Why are we not doing this on the web? Okay, a good example of this these days is actually WordPress and what they've been doing with auto updates. Regardless of what we think of them as a platform, there's a lot to be learned but the challenges that they're having. The biggest challenge I've always seen in the Joomla community is the lack of upgrade path for those versions beyond, like in 1X and 2X. There's still a tremendous amount of users on that. And they've just been left. And when we talk to them and say, why aren't you on the latest version? Oh, we can't. I can't afford that. There's no easy upgrade path. It's too challenging. It's too hard. How are we addressing that backwards compatibility? And maybe it's not where they can upgrade all the way, but can we patch? Because you know what happens? Nobody recognizes what version it is. They only see the platform. They say, ah, oh, it's Joomla again. Ah, oh, it's WordPress again. Ah, oh, silly Drupal. They don't say, well, it's Joomla 1.x and it's not their fault, right? It's the end user because they didn't upgrade, but we forked, we went this direction, we created this version, and they don't understand what version to go to, but that's okay. It, nobody cares about that. The only people that care about that are the developers and integrators. Okay? And there's a lot more end users than there are developers and integrators. Website owners are a critical piece to the online ecosystem. Okay? There's no denying that. They are also the weakest link. We can leave it to them and say, hey, you, we entrust you with our brand. We entrust you to do the right thing. Or we can take a more proactive step to ensuring we kind of secure what our platform's about and how they, how they interact online. So with that, my name is Tony Perez. Um, you can find me online at Perez Box, And I thank you for your time. I, I don't know if I just stand here or. Oh, okay. <laughs> stuck it stuck in the um, little boys' room. So um, we're now going straight into the next sessions. And if you've got your program, someone's got a program for me. Do the uh, removing glasses trick.